Okay. Okay. So, speaking to my vast audience, <laughs> I'm just going to watch on YouTube. Right? All right. Anyway, where we are in the book, I don't know. It's almost finished attention and I'll handle it. There's been a lot of two parts to transcendental analytics and transcendental dialectic. Transcendental analytics has two parts. Analytic process. The analytical principle has three parts. In the principle, yeah, the principle of that meaning. And then there's an appendix to phenomena in the human level to be just reading the next one. Well, I mean, I should read in the context of this question. Um, um, by the way, it's not absolutely clear that the table of contents should be organized this way. It's. Um, uh, it is, I think, exactly what Kemp Smith does. Let me see if that's true, actually. Yeah, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. Um, uh, well, I guess maybe that's clear. Maybe the only thing that's not clear is about the appendix, what it's an appendix to. Sometimes people, Think that this is an appendix to the entire transcendental analytic, for example. Um, and uh, in the A edition, the table of contents is very minimal. The first edition of the computer theory it can only list like the very uh, highest level divisions. I don't remember exactly how far it goes, but definitely not this far. The, in the second edition, there is no table of contents. <laughs> So you have to go to the third edition to see, but it looks like this is where it should be. And I think I understand why it's here, why it's an appendix to this. All right, anyway, that's for next time. Um, um, I have some. I have some thought that this actually could be on the same level of analytic concepts and analytical principles. But I guess that's really not what's happening. I'd like to be easier to understand what's doing here. I thought it was part three of the transcendental analytic, but it's really not. It's part three of the analytical principles. All right. So, what is this part about? Um, so, um, I think uh, it's hard to tell because, or uh, well, that is, I think it looks like Kant is saying what it's about, but after a long time of trying to understand this, I've concluded that's not what he's doing there. So it looks like he's saying what about what it's about. On B two ninety five, Kemp Smith, page two fifty seven, where he asked these two questions: um, 
right? He says, before we venture on this C, the C is the C of the transcendental dialectic. Right, which is like a C full of like illusions that will lead you astray and you'll crash into icebergs or whatever. So, uh, but before we venture on this C, he says, uh, it will be well to begin by casting a glance upon the map of the land which we are about to leave and to inquire first whether we cannot in any case be satisfied with what it contains, are not indeed under compulsion to be satisfied inasmuch as there may be no other territory upon which we can settle. And secondly, by what title we possess even this domain and can consider ourselves as secured against all opposing claims. So it sounds like that's what he's gonna talk about in Phenomena and Numina. The problem with that is it seems like he's already he's already answered those questions in the earlier parts of the transcendental analytic. Um, right, he's already answered the question. Um, uh, whether we can be satisfied with what this contains indeed are, are under compulsion to be satisfied right is he's he's already he's already shown why the categories can't be used beyond the realm of experience and um and therefore why the principles don't apl apply beyond the realm of experience and he's already uh explained by what title we possess even this domain um so it seems weird to have a section to answer this. Now, I mean, so Kant right away says what I just said. Although we have already given a sufficient answer to these questions in the course of the analytic, a summary statement of its solutions may nevertheless help to strengthen our convic conviction by focusing the various considerations in their bearing on the questions now before us. So, I mean, this makes it sound like the whole section called Phenomena and Numina is going to be nothing more than a summary statement of some stuff he's already said beforehand in the Transcendental Analytic, um, which uh, makes it sound like uh, it's not going to be very interesting. Um, However, when you read the section, and then even more so when you read the appendix, you realize that there's all kinds of things that he's talking about for the first time in this section that he's never mentioned before. <laughs> so, um, so if that's what it's supposed to be about, it's just not true. It's not just a summary of things he said before. So, I think what's happening here is that actually there is a summary of things he's already said before, but it consists of the very beginning of the next paragraph. Um, that is, it starts, we have seen that everything which the understanding derives from itself is though not borrowed from experience at the disposal of the understanding solely for use in experience. Um, uh, and it ends, well, I mean, I could read the whole thing, basically. The principles of pure understanding, whether constitutive a priori, like the mathematical principles, or merely regulative, like the dynamical, contain nothing but what may called the, be called the pure schema of possible experience. For experience obtains its unity only from the synthetic unity, which the understanding originally and of itself confers upon the synthesis of the imagination in its relation to apperception. And the appearances as data for a possible knowledge must already stand a priori in relation to and in agreement with that synthetic unity. Right, so those two sentences summarize the entire transcendental analytic and answer those two questions that he just asked. Do we have to be satisfied with this land because there isn't any other we can get to? And what's the origin of our title to it? 
Um, so it's not really true. Kant isn't really saying that this whole thing is going to be just a sum. He's saying, like, as a, as a preliminary starting off this section, he's saying it'd be a good idea, first of all, to summarize what we've already said. And then he asks another question. So I think this other question still isn't exactly the, the main topic of the section, but it's like a transition to it. And it's important in its own right. So the new question is, but although these rules of understanding are not only true a priori, but are indeed the source of all truth, that is of the agreement of our knowledge with objects, right? Remember, like, the whole way this works is that the, um, the principles must be true because I can't deny them without denying that there's an object of my consciousness, right? I can't deny them without denying that there's an empirical object, so there must be an empirical object because of the unity of apperception. So, um, so, uh, Anyway, but although these rules of understanding are not only true a priori, but are indeed the source of all truth, um, we are not satisfied with the expo exposition merely of that which is true, but likewise demand that account be taken of that which we desire to know, right? So the new question is, uh, okay, Kant, Everything you said is true, but what you know, why bother to prove? Like, why should we be interested in that? Um, what's the use of the transcendental analytic? So, um, why is this a problem? Um, Kant says why it's a problem almost uh, in the next sentence. It is actually, it is the very next sentence. If therefore from this critical inquiry, we learn nothing more than what in the merely empirical employment of understanding, we should in any case have practiced without any such subtle inquiry, it would seem as if the advantage derived from it by no means repays the labor expanded, ex sorry, expended. <laughs> Right, so, um, so the question is, okay, you've proved these principles, like the law of causality, that everything that happens must have a cause. Um, but, uh, you know, even Hume agrees that uh, we have no choice but to believe the law of causality, even though Hume says we can't justify it. Right? We can't show our title to it. In fact, we can't show our title to the concept of cause that it contains. Uh, Hume says, nevertheless, you know, uh, um, I can say as much as I want to to convince you of that right now. Like five minutes from now, when you walk out of the room, you're like, you're going to believe in causality. Because Hume says, I've explained why it's necessary, right? Like why, psychologically speaking, we have to believe. It. Now, I mean, and like, by the way, Hume saying that is an example of what he's talking about, right? Because Hume himself, in the course of proving that, you know, showing the like um, non-justifying reasons why we believe in causality is is using the law of causality himself <laughs> so um you know like you might think that's a problem for him but i th i think on the contrary it's like a perfect example of what he's talking about so he's saying you know we can we can show as much as we want that we're not entitled to this but we're going to keep believing in it <laughs> right so uh so if that's if even Hume admits that, then what's the point of going to all this trouble to prove it if everyone was already going to assume it anyway? That's the question. Um, I 
I mean, there may be a little bit of an exaggeration there in the sense that the system of principles, you know, they purport to prove certain things that um, well, for example, Leibnizians would definitely deny. And even I think some things that Cartesians would deny. Right. So like the fact that even Hume will admit it doesn't exactly mean that there's no one who needs a proof of it. Um, um, I mean, in other words, Kant is, is providing, among other things, providing a basis for Newtonian science in the system of principles. And Newtonian science, even in Kant's time on the continent, is, I think is still a little bit of a shaky state. Right, it was accepted much faster in England than it was in Europe, continental Europe. So, uh, and I mean, even let's say that by now everyone accepts it. Still, the fact that that's the time shows that, like, it's not true that everyone's going to assume all of these principles. Okay, but um, um, but I guess Kant has been thinking. You know, um, and I think rightly that in the long run, Newton didn't need his help, <laughs> right? The like, you know, Hume is right that the Newtonian science is based on the like the way we're really forced to think about the world. Um, so, you know, um, so, so Kant takes this to be a good question. He, he doesn't add something that, you know, I think in the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals, uh, he does add more or less explicitly, which is the worry that, um, that an inquiry that's not necessary might not only be a waste of time, but it might actually be dangerous. Um, that, uh, um, that, uh, causing people to regard as doubtful the things that they would anyway, anyway assume is not without like hazards. Um, uh, it uh, encourages skepticism or something, right? So, um, or maybe something worse than skepticism. Um, so he does not raise that directly, but I think he you can there's kind of an anxious sentence here. That his first answer to this new question. The reply may certainly be made that in the endeavor to extend our knowledge, a meddlesome curiosity is far less injurious than the habit of always insisting before entering on any inquiries upon antecedent proof of the utility of the inquiries. An absurd demand since prior to the completion of the inquiries, we are not in a position to form the least conception of this utility, even if it were placed before our eyes. Right, so what he's, like he's responding to someone there who is implicitly, I think, saying more than just you're wasting your time, right? Saying this is meddlesome curiosity and it's possibly injurious, right? And so Kant's first answer is, and you know, I mean, this is almost like um, there's sometimes. I don't know if this is exactly one of the words. There's, there's sometimes when it's clear that Kant is speaking to a sense, basically. Right? There's actually like some places where he says things like, you know, think that one of them is in the preface to the critique of pure reason. Like if government sees fit to interfere in the like publishing of academic works, they would be better off worrying about X than Y. <laughs> So, um, it, you know, I mean, there was censorship, right? So, like, uh, um, so, 
maybe he's even talking, you know, speaking to someone who's asked me a question like, should your should this book be allowed to be published? But in any case, you know, um, um, his answer to that is maybe not that convincing, right? I mean, his answer to that is, well, yeah, meddlesome curiosity may be injurious, but not as injurious as um, um, trying to stop lines of inquiry before you understand the answer and can see what's useful about it. Um, so, well, there may be more things to say about that, but I want to get on to what the section is actually about. So the the therefore the second answer is there is, however, one advantage which may be made comprehensible and of interest even to the most refractory and reluctant learner. Right. So now he's saying, but moreover, I can show you right away that this isn't just meddlesome curiosity. There's an important use for what I've done here. Um, the advantage that while the understanding occupied merely with its empirical employment and not reflecting upon the sources of its own knowledge may indeed get along quite satisfactorily. Yet there is one task to which it is not equal, that namely of determining the limits of its employment and of knowing what it is that may lie within and what it is that lies without its own proper sphere. So the um, the thing that we're now going to be able to do that we that Hume wouldn't if we step with Hume we wouldn't be able to do is to turn around and say uh, okay and. Uh, um, therefore, these are the limits to our proper sphere of employment of the understanding. The understanding reflecting upon itself. Um, and basically, I think like this is what phenomena and numina is really about. It's about the understanding reflection on itself. Now, I mean, uh, um, anyway, and that one message every minute from someone who's running for a school board or something. <laughs> Please come out and help. All right. Anyway, uh, um, so. It's not to say that we're doing the reflection here for the first time, right? Like again, that's basic. That, that's what we've done, here, right? That's why the you, that's why the analytics so far um, has well. I maybe mean, see again. This is why I wish this was out here in the part three of the transcendental analytics. Because it's really like it's weird. It's like this. This is the part where we actually did the reflection. Right? Because this is the part where we actually um, answered those questions about what land do we have title to and what's the limit of that that we can't go beyond. So this part is about reflection. <laughs> um. So, you know, and um, that I think is why the appendix here, which is about the concept of reflection, we'll see what concepts of reflection are next time, or at least try to understand what they are. But that's why this is where this appendix belongs, because this is a section about reflection. Reflection of the understanding on itself, and therefore is an appendix to discussing the concept of reflection. Um,
And um, the, uh, once you see that that's the thing that Hume wouldn't have been able to apply. And I mean, I think it's true. You can see, uh, um, for example, in the dialogues on natural religion, you can see Hume's characters like trying to figure out why uh, it's legitimate to use reasoning from analogy and think other things like that when we're when we're discussing the natural world, even though of course they know that like everything they're they're susceptible to possible skeptical doubt. Um, but like why that's legitimate, but on the other hand, uh, um, if you then try to extend that type of reasoning to show that there's an uh, intelligent cause of the world, you've somehow gone over some limit. Um, and uh, uh, they don't really have a, they don't have a principal distinction to base that on. Right, all I can say is, um, I think it's especially the character of Philo who says this. He just says, well, we've just gone too far from our original, uh, right? Like the world is is just not similar enough to a plot or a book or whatever to, uh, to base this kind of analogous reasoning. Um, but how similar is similar enough? Um, Right, so whereas Pat is going to, Pat thinks that uh, if you understand, like, and, I mean, again, it's because, right, like, it goes like this in the dialogue concerning natural religion. Um, Philo, you know, says, raises skeptical doubts about the argument from design, basically. And then Cleanthes says, but you don't really believe this radical skepticism, Philo. I mean, like, uh, uh, let's see when we're done, whether you leave by the door or by the window. <laughs> um, so, uh, and like, moreover, I know that you're really interested in the latest discoveries in natural science, like, you know, um, Newtonian, mechanics and its explanation of the orbits of the planets and so forth. Like, um, you know, uh, you can't tell me that you don't believe in using these uh, principles of like expecting what's happened in the past to happen before, or expecting similar things to behave similarly, whatever. You, you can't tell me you don't believe in using these. And this is no different. And, you know, Viola says, well, yeah, for sure. I'm not some kind of radical skeptic. You know, uh, uh, I'm not claiming that, that, that I don't believe that I should leave by the door rather than by the window or whatever. I'm just saying that in, in this particular case, it goes too far, right? So, um, um, the, like, Philo's dilemma in trying to show that is that you can't say, uh, this is what makes the use of those principles legitimate in the case of going by the door of the window or in the case of learning about the solar system. But then when, it, um, and so that ground of legitimacy doesn't apply when you go too far and try to reach the conclusion about God. Um, he can't say that because uh, he represents Hume insofar as, I mean, none of the characters in that dialogue are exactly Hume, I think. But he can, he represents Hume in so far as he is like uh, knows that from a skeptical point of view, you can you can't justify the use of those principles at all. Whereas Kant is saying, I can justify them, and that's why I can set a definite limit to whatever they apply and where they go. Um And that is useful. That's important because 
um, if the understanding of empirical employment cannot distinguish whether certain questions lie within its horizon or not, it can never be assured of its claims or of its possessions, but must be prepared for many a humiliating disillusionment whenever, as must unavoidably and constantly happen, it oversteps the limits of its own domain and loses itself in opinions that are baseless and misleading. So that is referring to what's coming up, what's coming up in the transcendental dialectic, right? That is in the transcendental dialectic, Kant is going to explain why it is that the understanding unavoidably and constantly tries to go over these limits. Um, but uh, before we can get started in the transcendental dialectic, we have to understand how it is we establish that those are limits. That is, how the understanding was able to limit itself. Um, so this is a reason to prove things that you're already sure were true. Were true. Even though you are already sure that these things were true, it's worthwhile proving them because in proving them, you learn why they're, what the basis of their legitimacy is and therefore what their limits are. And then you can go on in the transcendental dialectic to like pay careful attention to what it is that makes us overstep those limits. And, like, um, uh, warn us how to avoid having that happen. Sure if that's exactly the right way to put it, but something like that. Um, I mean, you can also kind of say, you know, again, I would like this but this explanation better. It's unfortunately out here, but it's not it's in here. So, but even so, you can kind of see here these three parts are um, these three parts correspond to the like um, three moments in the table of categories. It's the three columns. Right, the schematism is about like the, you know, as usual, you can think of those in a simple way by thinking about those three convertible transcendentals that Kant discusses in the in section 12, after, right after the table of, or more or less right after the table of categories. Where he says that transcendental unity just uh, expresses the fact that our representation, our representations subjectively considered, have to have a single theme, like the theme of a story, or something like that, right? That is the representation. Uh, it's not about the unity of the object; it's about the unity of the representation, and it all has to be the same. And whereas this one is about the consequences that flow out of that. So again, it's not about the multiplicity of the object. It's about the multiplicity. It's not, it's not about the quantitative multiplicity of the object. It's about the qualitative multiplicity of the representation, that it has to have um, consequences that flow out of it. Um, and then he says, like this one is about the masking back the pain and consequences of the feet. So like you've got all of it. That's the qualitative totality of the content. Um so right, this is about you know the so to speak theme of each one of the categories. Oh. Uh, Whereas this is about the consequences that flow out of that. And this is about the uh, way all those consequences match back exactly to the extent of the original theme. This, this, the theme 
of each category is time in some respect, <laughs> right? That is as 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 unified as unified category. Um, so it's like you know the case of our sensible intuition, and this is like showing how. Um, uh, No, I'm not, I'm not explaining this very well. I just thought of this this morning. <laughs> but I think it's right. Um, that, um, like, remember, you know, totality, quantitative totality, as my understanding, is a matter of, of like, adding up the self-difference of the same, right? Like this gold, this gold, this gold, this gold. Um, adding it up to some uh, uh, unified total within limits. So that you get a proper subject for a singular judgment, like this gold weighs five grams. So, Right, that's the same thing this is doing with our experience in general. It's like taking um, the um, Like how the result is the same, right? It's the qualitative totality of the object of experience of, of nature, so to speak. It all it's not it's not a quantitative thing, right? It's not like nature in general is uh is has limits drawn against around it, like a piece of gold. In fact, that's going to be one of the dialectical uh Conclusions that the time trace is still a form of the transmutable illusion, the transcendental dialect. So, in a quantitative sense, right, like nature as the object of experience doesn't have limits, but it has qualitative limits, and it's limited by the quality of the, like the Schaffen type, the constitution or quality of our form of intuition. So, like, in other words, this is saying how our form of intuition allows the cat each category to mean some one thing. This is saying how um, uh, the fact that they mean one thing, like, allows them to be applied in, um, allows truth to be derived from them. And this is saying, how all those truths, however, ultimately relate back to the limits established here. Okay. I still don't think I said it exactly right, but um, you guys are all looking very skeptical. Yes. <laughs> what? I see you have this idea of it's something like that. I'm still not seeing it. It's supposed to be analogous to what's going on when you use and combine unity and plurality to represent a limited piece of an empirical object. And I'm not succeeding in making that clear. I mean, it's supposed to be like this, but different because it's qualitative rather than quantitative. Whatever that means. Yeah. I don't know. So maybe I don't have the piece of this quite put together. Um, but
Um, I mean, that is, I can explain why in these moments it's kind of like one of those transcendentals, but I can't sort of carry the whole thing through and explain why this kind of like goes back to this. Um, Ray, I mean, it's like, this is this is definitely about looking at the categories in themselves as you know where this is about drawing consequences from them. So that's definitely like the relationship between unity and truth. Um, but um, and on the other hand, this is definitely about like um, you know great good here is understood as like perfect complete. It, like these, so like, like this is definitely about showing that that um, that these principles completely use up our synthetic a priori knowledge. These principles, as, like these principles, as applied to the object of experience, completely use up our synthetic a priori knowledge. There isn't room for anything else outside. Finished. That's that's what we're talking about here. Yeah, maybe I've heard of Jen, you know, maybe I can say that today, but I don't know. I don't I don't know if I should try to say it the other down because uh, it probably took a lot of uh, things that are discussed in this section, but um, um but that so like I think if you think about this, you can see how it would work. And, um, and I mean, I, I try to point out this, this kind of thing as often as I can, because as I think I said once before, Kant is like, as opposed to someone like Hegel, who's constantly hitting you over the head with how systematic he is, Kant is like downplayed, right? But there's like all kinds of, um, structures going on in his philosophy that he does not call attention to. So you have to kind of like figure them out for yourself. I think that's probably why he wants you to figure them out for yourself. He doesn't want to just tell you. I mean, Hegel also in a way doesn't want you. That's, that's why like a lot of times in, in Hegel, you know, you have to look at the table of contents to notice. <laughs> that everything is divided into three and then each of those is divided into three and whatever. Like if you just read through the text, um, you won't say very often things like, okay, and this is a second moment, so blah, blah, blah. You know, for, for, for similar reasons that he, he wants it to be imminent. He doesn't want you to apply externally some kind of like mechanical System to understand what he's saying, but I think that's what I think on the difference. But Kant is more worried about it, or is worried about it in a different way to the point where he kind of you know, actively gives the impression that he's just kind of talking about one thing after another. I, anyway, um. Okay, so uh, so I'm not I'm not sure about what I have to say now, but you know I am pretty sure about this. That this is what phenomena I knew when I was about. It's about the understanding's reflection on itself, and therefore this is the section where Kant addresses what we understand as the same, kind of like the two biggest objections that people historically have had to this book. So the first one is about things in themselves. That is human life. Again, I think as I mentioned before, some people deny this, like some class interpreters deny that these are equivalent. But first of all, I think Kant keeps saying they're equivalent <laughs> in a lot of places. Second of all, uh, I think I understand why they're in the book. So, um, so I'm going to treat things in themselves and, and, and Newman as the same. 
So, right, so the big attack now, the big question people have is, you know, well, if you can't say anything, you can't know anything about things in themselves, why do you keep talking about them? Right? That doesn't make any sense. Um, Hegel says that already. Uh, Schopenhauer, another way, says that. Hegel says that. Um, it's kind of a standard post confident move. But the question is, well, I don't think it's talk think about it. What does he have to say about it? Um, and the second question is what's sometimes called critique of critique. Where the question is like, um, okay, you're explaining what kind of cognition we can and can't have based on an analysis of what our cognitive faculties are and how they work. But um, what faculty are you using when you do that? <laughs> right? Like what's the basis of what what's the basis of our critical knowledge? So right, again, um, this in different ways, like in post-Kantian idealism, this led in the idea that that this kind of transcendental reflection is actually where we do have an intellectual intuition, right? Like that's what Schelling says. Um, and you know, perhaps, but in a more subtle way, you could understand Hegel as saying that. Um, and on the other hand, in a less subtle way, you could understand Husserl as saying that. Um, so, uh, but again, the question has to be, well, what about Kant? He didn't think that we, he didn't think that when we discussed our own faculties, then all of a sudden we're talking about things in themselves. So we're using some magical new faculty of intellectual intuition to do that. Um, so, um, um, So like these these questions are connected because basically the question is something like this. How can the understanding represent itself as limited if it can't represent any alternative to its object? Right? So like that to draw back the picture I just drew before. Um or how can the understanding represent its own fundamental limits? If it can't represent anything that's outside of the scene. Um, so, um, uh, I think Kant is, um, so I think, I mean, I think that explains why, although this section is about the understanding's reflection upon itself, thereby determining its own limits. The title is Phenomena and Numina, or uh, more precisely of the division of all objects into Phenomena and Numina. Okay. The ground of the distinction of all objects in general into Phenomena and Numina. Because like for the understanding to represent itself in the way Kant needs it to be. Um, what it needs to be able to do is represent this distinction. And what lies inside this line is phenomenon. What lies outside, I mean, this is a little bit.
the two kinds of uh, objects that we can think but can't rep represent as possible. One is objects of ostensible intuition different from our own. So Kant does mention that sometimes, but he doesn't spend a lot of time talking. The other is objects of an intellectual intuition, which is what Newman is. So, right, so by the way, the singular phrase, these are plural, phenomena and Newman, I hope you already might have seen it. Right, the singular is phenomenon. Numenon and the plural is phenomena and human. And parallel is a little bit deceptive here because I mean, numenon certainly means something that is the object of the intellect. Right? This is a passive, this is a Greek passive particle. And it's a passive, passive particle of the verb. No, which means like to intelligence, <laughs> like, or if you translate use of understanding, then you can translate this as to understand, right? So, a numenon is what is understood, that is the object of um, understanding or intellect, whereas phenomenon. Yeah, it really comes from a deponent verb. It's a little bit. Anyway, a phenomenon only means something that appears, that is an appearance. It doesn't mean the object of a faculty of phenomenalism. Um, so, um, uh, but in any case, this is the contrast that we have. Right, I think so. So, what Kant is really interested in here is how the understanding um, can represent itself as discursive rather than um, intuitive. Right, that is how the understanding can represent itself as the kind of understanding that has a, needs a sensible intuition to give it an object. And an object given by a sensible intuition is a phenomenon. As opposed to the kind of understanding that can have an object all on its own. That is an intuitive intellect, or is it the same thing as an intellectual intuition? An understanding that has an object without any form of sensibility to go between them. Um, I mean, you know, one thing that's confusing about this is that as the confusion Kant actually mentions, like in an aside, that of course, like strictly speaking, phenomena are human. Right? That is everything that um, is an object of sensible intuition also is an object of discursive intellect. Because again, like uh, you can't represent an object with only sense or with only uh, thought or discursive intellection. You need to be affected in a manifold way, but you also need to, to, to like to. Take this as the effect of an object on you. You have to represent these as all following from a certain rule. Right? And then you represent the object as having an analogous rule again. So, um, so this object is an object of sense and an object of intellect or understanding. But Kant says, you know, 
Um, of course, that's not what I mean by new now. I mean something that's an, an object of understanding alone without principle. When I distinguish between phenomenon and meaning, right? Like in here we have objects of understanding, and out here we also have objects of understanding. But the difference is that in here it's objects of understanding by way of sense. Whereas out here is objects of understanding without any sensibility to go into. And again, the question is, if we can't even so much as refer to these things, how can we how can we make that like how could I say what I just said? Right? This is a distinction between like it's like this is a distinction between the things we can refer to and other things that we can't refer to. But I just referred to them. <laughs> right? That's like a self-contradiction. Um, So, I mean, the basic answer to this, I think, is relatively simple. I mean, the answer is the concept, we don't have a positive conception of a new noun, we only have a negative conception of a new noun. Meaning that, you know, um, 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 We can, um, it, I mean, basically, like just what I just said, the concept of a, a phenomenon is something that to represent it requires both an intellect and a faculty of sense. So, you know, so the concept of phenomenon has two parts, and you can like abstract from one of the parts. And when you abstract from one of the parts, you're left with a part that could go with that part or without, right? Like that's what abstraction means. So, um, so, like, so just in that act of abstraction, I like, um, I've set up an alternative in the sense that, like. I understand my concept of phenomenon to be something and not something else. Um. So, um. Um, let's, let's introduce the distinction you posited.
Oh, here we go. So, right, so this is on B307 on Kemp Smith, page 268. If by noumenon we mean a thing so far as it is not an object of our sensible intuition, and so abstract from our mode of intuiting it, this is a noumenon in the negative sense of the term. But if we understand by it an object of a non-sensible intuition, we thereby presuppose a special mode of intuition, namely the intellectual, which is not that which we possess, and of which we cannot comprehend even the possibility. This would be noumenon in the positive sense of the term. So again, right, what he's saying, that what he's saying is that when we talk about noumena, we're just recording the fact that the concept phenomenon has two parts. And that one part doesn't make the other part necessary. Um, this doesn't make the other part necessary. There's no contradiction in using it without the other. Only we can't do it. <laughs> right? I mean, that is, we can't use it to refer to anything. But the problem isn't a contradiction. So, therefore, we can think this thought human, but we just can't, we aren't thinking about anything when we think. It's a concept that's formally okay, but transcendentally not. Right? That it's, 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 it meets the subjective conditions for being a concept, which is that it's not contradict itself. But it doesn't meet the objective conditions for being a concept, namely that it can set it to refer to itself. So, um, um, so, like when we talk about human in that sense, all we're really expressing is that. Um, we can't derive the um, the way we require objects to be presented to us in intuition from the law of contradiction. We can't derive the we can't derive our mode of intuition from the law of contradiction. We can't show that there would be a contradiction. For objects to be presented in some other way. And so, like, again, you, you might think you'd be interested both in objects presented by another form of sensible intuition and objects presented without any sensible intuition. But, um, but again, here he's, he's, he's focusing on only on the second concept, right? So, like, phenomenon here is taking as meaning the object of any sensible intuition in general. And so even that we can't derive from the principle of from the law of contradiction, right? It's like I can't say, um, well, the reason uh, I don't have a principle of actuality from which I can derive the actual existence of the objects of my representation is because that such a faculty would be a contradiction in terms. Um, all I can say is that um, I have no way of representing the, the possibility of such a passage, the real possibility of it, right? All I can see is that it's not self-contradictory. I can't see how to use it to refer to something. Right. That is the concept of new and not doesn't contradict itself because the concept of an intuitive intellect. Right? Like the object of an intuitive intellect would be a new. The object of the search is important to the phenomenon. I mean, I see, I guess the question is, which one's which one first? I, was, I just said, this doesn't contradict itself because this doesn't contradict itself. But it's probably better to say, I mean, this doesn't contradict itself because this doesn't contradict itself. 
because when we abstract away from the conditions under which we actually cognize objects, we're not left with a contradiction. Right? We're only left with an empty um, like attempt to represent an object. <laughs> so because of that, we can't we there's no way we could see a contradiction in the beginning of another faculty that um, there wouldn't be likewise. But that's as far as it goes, right? So, like, th and this is the section where Hodges is clearest about this. There's other sections where um, there's places where it sounds like, and we've already pointed to some of them, where it sounds like Hodges is really saying, no, there are things in themselves somewhere, and they're the basis of our experience. They're what appears to us as experience, whatever. But here in this section, Hodges is very clear that. We can't, we, these things, this, this isn't the kind of thing, right? Like, we don't have an idea of a quality that would make something into a new. This is the kind of object. Object of what? Object of this kind of faculty. But we don't know that this kind of faculty is even possible. So therefore, we certainly don't know that it's object free. Although again, it's probably the argument really stated to go the other way, but the point is like um, um he says both of them in this section very clearly. Um And therefore, Kant says, so this is a little bit farther down the same page I was just reading from before. Um, the doctrine of sensibility is likewise the doctrine of the noumenon in the negative sense. That is, of things which the understanding must think without this reference to our mode of intuition, therefore not merely as appearances, but as things in themselves. The doctrine of sensibility is like all the content of what we say about Newman is all about what goes on in here. And what we say about what goes on in here, again, is that um, we can abstract from the way objects are actually given to us, and we're not left with a contradiction. So, right, that's, that's the doctrine of sensibility, right? Like, that's about, like, the relation, about the fact that sensibility is different from understanding. Um, so that also is the whole doctrine of you. That's all there is to say about it. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, um, all the objects of understanding alone are just and law, phenomena of the understanding, of objects of understanding and sense. Yeah. All objects that expose the understanding are yeah. yeah. I, I, I say, um, all like for the one or the other. Yeah. yeah. So, like the a priori, everything, like the transcendental aesthetic, space and time, the concepts. Yeah. Are those vanilla? I guess I'm not sure, but I'll say different concepts. Do they help into either? Well, that, you know, like, like, like where, yeah, like that's, you, that's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, um, So 
you know, like, Thank you, Angela. Um, the answer should be in the section. <laughs> but, um, So I, I think there's there's two ways of thinking about it. So there's two possible answers. So one is kind of Socratic. I mean, and and that and Kant does give that answer in this section, where he says, like, um, uh, just try to say what a quantity is, without um, using the. Uh, schema of succession. So he says, I mean, so you can say a quantity, a thing is represented as a quantity insofar as it's represented as like the same as many together. But um, uh, what could make it possible for something to be the same as many together? And like, um, he'll find that uh, Socrates will just, if you give that answer, will lead you to contradict yourself. Um, um, so that's what I think the Socratic answer is like, um, you can give no account of your concept of quantity except by saying, well, um, when I represent something as a quantity, I represent it as, um, I represent how many times unity can be placed within it. And then he says, but that how many times is the form of time, right? It's like the form of internal sense. So, um, um, so, like, in all of that, there's no, uh, there is reflection that is this, like, um, stopping to ask, what do I need to think when I think a certain thing? But it's, the answer doesn't come by looking at my faculties from the side or something. Um, you know, I mean, the question is, the question about that answer is, like, that doesn't that sound empirical? And, you know, like Socrates sometimes makes it sound but surely this is the prime example of where he's being ironic. Right? He makes it sound like maybe the next person he asks will give him a good answer. <laughs> um, right? So we're just, you know, like he's uh, he's out uh, trying to 
obtain self-knowledge in order to test the God who said that so no one is wiser than Socrates. Okay, so he doesn't understand how that could be. So he goes around asking one person after another, right? But surely Socrates doesn't really think the next person he asks is really going to give him the answer to these questions. You know, so, um, like, So I think that's supposed to be the answer or one answer, but I'm not sure how well it works. Like, or I'm not sure, I don't feel like it's completely thrown into what Kant means by it. I think, you know, there's also an answer. Um, um, in the arguments in the aesthetic that, that try to show that space is the um, pure form of external sense, for example. Right, that like at least so like for one thing, the way I understand it, we if you um, try to think what the table would be without its extension, um, you uh, you know find that you're not thinking anything. So again, like your. Um, The reflection comes from trying to use your faculty to do something, with, but then seeing that it can't do that. Um, uh, not from like somehow turning around and observing your faculty. So, um, so now, like if you ask things about like the empirical concept, like how do I know that I have an empirical concept of of a horse, for example, you know. Um, so again, it's the same. Like, um, I don't do it, and of course, the, I mean, it's certainly not how we do it, right? It's certainly not by like looking inside and seeing if there's a certain like kind of um, object in our mind, a concept. <laughs> looking for it in there, right? I mean, you do it, you determine whether you have it by recognizing horses. <laughs> um, so, like, this, it, this is supposed to be a, a transcendental version of that, so to speak, right? You don't do it by, um, You don't do it by looking at your intellect and seeing that it has certain qualities that make it discursive, as opposed to like certain other qualities which you make it intuitive. Um, you, you know, you do it by using your understanding to recognize synthetic a priori principles. And um, paying attention to what you're doing when you do it. That's not like it sound again like this, right? So it's not, I, I don't know, is that? <laughs> well, I, I was wondering like, it's interesting, so these are objects, variable phenomena, or maybe not. But like he said, I remember, like when he talked about space and time, space and time, in terms of they're not concepts, they're, Intuition. Yeah. Are they not objects then? Maybe you could say it that way. As well, they are. are. I mean, so objects is going to be free for us to take it up and think about it. So they are like, look, I mean, so the simple answer to the question, like concepts, faculties, whatever, are are they phenomena or new? The answer is, well, they're, they're powers of a certain kind, a certain substance. What substance? Well, um, me, except, uh, remember, as, um, as he, I mean, I think this is kind of 
uh, easy to see throughout the transcendental deduction and elsewhere, but that he, he, he brings it to bear in the reputation of idealism that um, that inner sense uh, doesn't give anything permanent. It's only changes. So like when you say it's a power of a substance that is me, you don't mean the object of inner sense. It has to be something permanent that always has that capability. And what is that? Well, it's, it's a body. Right? So like, so what is a concept? It's a certain power that a certain body has. Um, yeah, so, um, um, you might say, well, but doesn't it have to be a different way of, of thinking about it? Where like, I don't think of it as just another corporeal capacity like heating or gravity or whatever. Um, and, you know, I think, so the answer is from a theoretical point of view, no, there doesn't have to be another way. There can't be another way. Like, I mean, remember, we're going to see this more when we get to the transcendental dialectic. Kant says that human actions are determined by causes in the past. Right? And, and you know, I mean, you have to say that, as Hume points out. Right? We don't, when we think of people as acting freely, we don't mean their actions are unpredictable. I mean, on, the, on the contrary, right? Like in Hume's famous example, you know, a prisoner will set to work rather on the iron of the bars than on the like a uh, determination of the jailer, right? Like I'm, I, I, I think it's going to be easier to break the iron bars and get out than to convince the jailer to let me go. <laughs> right? So, like, human actions are determined. But again, like Kant says in the, I didn't get to talk about this too much, but it's, I mean, it's basically another version of that same principle. That you know, um, the cause of every change is always a substance, and um, again, no substance is given in inner sense. So, if human actions are subject to the law of causality, they're subject to the law of um, corporeal causality. That's the only kind we can understand. So, right, like if you wanted to gather enough information to perfectly predict someone's actions, you would look inside their brain and figure out what's happening. I think that's what Kant believes, right? So, like from a theoretical point of view, yeah, you would find in their brain what it is that makes them, quote unquote, have a conscience. Um, it's only from a practical point of view. Um, that we're forced to think of ourselves in a different way. And like, that's not really the subject of this course, that, right, that has to do with the moral philosophy, but it's just, well, I mean, it does get discussed somewhat in this book, but only in the doctrine of the method, which you're not getting to. Um, but, um, but it's, but we have already seen, that I think the most important thing it says about this book, which is the preface, it says, that the whole reason for doing this is to make sure that when we do have to think of ourselves in a different way for practical purposes, there won't be a contradiction between that and our theoretical philosophy, right? Because like the law of causality, we won't have to say, oh, and this, you know, there's an exception to the law of causality because there can't be an exception to it. But we say rather, um, you know, we're no longer looking at ourselves as phenomena, and therefore the law of causality doesn't apply. <laughs> um, so, um, I don't know, did, did all that put together somehow help? I mean, I,
there's 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 only two kinds of things that can be going on in a small argument, basically. <laughs> like, instead of picking up one another thing, like, um, I'm trying to put it together for this set. Everything is either analytic or practical. <laughs> right? I mean, so, um, um, In some sense of practical. So, like that thing about, um, you know, you can't say, if I say, if I base my argument in the transcendental deduction on the fact that you're a discursive intellect, you can't say, well, but maybe I'm not, give me an argument. Because if you weren't a discursive intellect, you couldn't ask for an argument. So, I mean, it's uh, that's a version of that's like a simple version of the type of thing I was just saying about like just try to do it, and you'll find you can't. It's but it's try to do it, not in the sense of trying some action, but seeing whether you, you know, um. Fit object for your will. I think, you know, like somehow the thing about like try and say what quantity is without the schema, or like try and say what a table is without its extension. Yeah. Um, or also like, um, so. Right, so I'm, I'm doing this, I and mean, now I'm talking about things kind of out of order because you know you asked the question and I just onto that, but it starts up underneath. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, well, I mean, because I think I, I gave, I think the simple version of Kant's answer to this, right? The simple version is just, uh, you know. I'm not referring to anything. I'm not using a concept that's capable of referring to anything when I talk about you. Um, I'm only using it to call attention to the structure of the concept of phenomena. Um, so I think that's the answer. Um, but a lot of what goes on in the section is in so so like. That answer is definitely given very and you know explicitly in the section. The answer to this must be in there somewhere, but you know, I just tried my best to try to find where it is, and I'm not sure I got it straight. But um, but most of the section is spent like kind of dealing with the question, what makes it so hard to accept this answer? Um right, like that starts on um Uh, actually starts before what I was just reading on B305. No, oh, it must be before B305. Yes. Oh uh, yeah, okay. B305 on page 266 in Kemp Smith. But we are here subject to an illusion from which it is difficult to escape. Now, this illusion apparently is not the transcendental illusion that we're gonna talk about in the dialectic. It's a different illusion, I think, which is in itself surprising. But anyway, here's the illusion. The categories are not, as regards their origin, grounded in sensibility, like the forms of intuition, space, and time. And they seem, therefore, to allow of an application extending beyond all objects of the, sense of the senses. 
right? So like, what he's saying is that what makes it hard to accept the answer is that it, when we try to use the categories um, or when we abstract from a sensible concept of the categories, it's, you know, it's like, I guess it's the difference between those two things that I was just saying. Right, like if you try to think what the table would be without an extension, there's like nothing left. Right, I mean, there's no property of the table that's not extended through the extension of the table. So, uh, like, take away the extension, and there's no table. But when, but the other thing, like just try to think of a quantity without thinking of the sensible scheme, without thinking of succession, like adding units one after another. So we are left with some. Um, and since we are left with something, it seems like we ought to be able to take that something that we're left with and like, um, um, consider the other cases we could do this. So it's right, like if you, you know, for example, if you, um, think of a dog as an animal with a certain differential, you know, I don't know what. Famously, we never know what the differentiator is speaking about. Uh, perhaps we know for human beings it's rational or something like that, but for dogs, like, you know, what's the essential characteristic of dogs? Like for dogs, so we have at least some substitutes for them. So, like, you know, say it's barking. You know, I guess there's other animals in the So, um, so, like, if we think of it, if we, if, when we think of the dog, we're thinking of the barking animal. And then we abstract from the bark. We're still thinking of something, an animal. But we're not thinking of it, we're not thinking specifically of this. Right? It's like, specifically, is the right word to use, right? We're not thinking of this species of animal. We're just thinking of animals in general, that is, as a genus, right? So, um, and so normally when we do that, when we carry out an abstraction, and we find that we're still left with something, that shows us that there um, are other possible species. Right? Like, here's the thing, you know, it's not that a conceptual concept, but that a general concept is always such that it can be, that I'm always thinking that it's possibly applied in connection with some other concept. Yeah. You know, so I take away the specific content from the genus, and now I'm left with the idea that the animal could be applied to something, perhaps a dog, but perhaps something else. Right, so when we abstract from the barking in the dog, we get like a larger sphere of possibility, other possible things. Um, and so, like, it seems like then when we do the same thing up here, right, and in between would go bottom. And this is this, this is part of the so-called uh, um, tree of porphyry. You know, I'm drawing it upside down, so it's just more of a use for the tree, right? But but I mean, there's other steps in between that, but it's, this is probably not appearing on the scene. Definitely not. So, um, uh, you know, under body, we have animals and other kinds of bodies. And then up here, we have substance. 
and it seems like this is another step of abstraction, like all the others. And so, like when we carry out a subtraction, we finally still have some idea. So we think that uh, you know we reveal the larger space of possibility, which means we could get something else. Substance is not a possibility. Um, but Kant says, and again, this is the thing I keep coming back to is one of the central ideas of the book, that the categories are not like them. It's true that they're broad in the case in which we can apply them. So uh, let me say this is one category, right? And here's a schema. So the schema realizes the category and at the same time restricts it. So, you know, um, um, it applies the, the category to some specific object. And so we can abstract them. But we abstract from it rather than being left with a larger sphere of possibility. We're just left with a more abstract concept because we don't know how to apply to anything else. Okay, I, I've gone over time. So um, I hope that's, well, I actually went quite a bit over time. Sorry. Um, I hope that's somewhat helpful and I will see you next.